What's up, guys? Kai here with TransformYourGame.net, and I am joined by my fellow teammate and special guest, Richard Wyatt. Say hello to the to the YouTube crowd, Richard. Hello, YouTube crowd. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, Kai. As you kind of know, uh, if you're you know a particular regular attendee of our channel or subscriber or something like that, he's kind of the purveyor of the video content. So I feel lucky just to be a part of it today. Thank you, Kai. <laughs> yeah. Um, so. So basically, the reason why we are gathered here today is because me, you, you and I, we uh, both participated in the Vector Sigma Seal tournament, and um, when you guys are going to be seeing this video, the tournament will have already ended. But we're recording this right now after getting our top eight pools, and what we decided to do was talk about our previous tournament or the Swiss rounds, and then. Uh, do that real quick and then talk about how we decided to build our top eight pools. And as a um, disclaimer, we've already built the pools, we've already submitted the deck list, so n there was no deck collusion or any of that nonsense. Uh, it's already been built, so we're just talking about how we decided onto the, the deck that we ended up submitting. So that's that, we just wanted to give you guys a little peek into how uh, that deck process went since we didn't do that for the Swiss rounds. Absolutely. Um, speaking of the Swiss rounds, uh, I feel like this is a great moment for me to go ahead and give a quick summary of how mine went. Uh, so the team that I played was actually Megatron Fallen Hero with Kreb, and then Sky Shadow Plane, the 4 bowl 2, and then I had Brawn Demolitions as a, in a 5-star slot. Um, people at home might notice I was only 24 stars. I did have a couple of options, combinations of characters to use all 25 stars. I think that the team that I picked was uh, kind of like almost inarguably better than every other, every combination of characters that was 25 stars, except for maybe if I had played Optimus Prime Legendary Warrior instead of Megatron alongside Kreb as my only headmaster. I guess Titanmaster, forgive me. Um, my battle deck was pretty good. It wasn't amazing. I didn't have access to either, to two of some of the like key staples of the format, which is be hollow matter projector or disassemble, uh, which are great ways to counteract opposing non-attack damage uh, and you know other upgrades, particularly since weapons are key. What answers to weapons that you can consistently have access to are almost just as key. Um, my deck did have a lot of weapons though, and access to a master sword on top of it, which I think was pretty awesome. Uh, I did have a solid number of orange pips in my pool. I had seven, I believe which is uh, a number I was totally happy to sleeve up. Um, and I basically, I think I played every single orange pit as well. Although I, I, that's a principle most people hold to at this point. Um, I also had a handheld blaster and an amplified shield among uh, my battle deck. I actually found that blue pips seem to be more relevant in this format than in previous sealed formats. And by sealed formats, I mean uh, Siege 1 by itself and the Siege 1, Siege 2 combo, uh, just because there's so many black pips in that format. And I think there are a little bit fewer here um, as well as the fact that there are more big attacks. So limiting things down to just the pierce, reducing damage to the, as close as you can to the damage floor has been really, really good for me. Mm -hmm. um, I was able to go 3-0 and in my first three rounds and fortunately double draw my way into top eight, which was great. Low stress, that's how you want to do it, you can. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, I gotta say, like, I think my toughest match is probably my round one opponent. My round one opponent was Pool24, Jesse of uh, the Shuffle Bus podcast. Uh, really good dude, great games. Um, his deck was awesome. I was terrified of it from the moment we sat down. He had Roadbuster, so a super rare. And he had Horrible with Kreb, which is pretty insane, and a lot of black pips to trigger Horrible as well. And he also had Crankcase, who is maybe one of the most impressive cards in Sealed, for, like, from my perspective. Oh, just because yeah. he's everywhere. And he attacks for so much damage. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, that was terrifying. But I was able to squeak that one out 2-1. Um, I played against some other really solid decks as well. I got a new respect for Mind Wipe in this tournament. Um, and also, basically every time any player played Kami and Crash, it was the end of the game. So <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. Those, those were like, yeah, I mean, I, I, you should know. You're a king of Camion Crash over there. You love that card. I love the card. I, surprisingly, I did not put it as my favorite card in the uh, in the Vector Sigma uh, interview thing because uh, I never actually got to play that card. In the top eight profile? 
Yeah, I never actually got to play Kamen Fire. Crash, so yeah, yeah. Well, as someone who played it in almost every round, let me tell you, it's a sweet one. It's pretty good. But, um, yeah, so... How'd you go? So my rounds, um, my first two rounds were, I would say, pretty easy. Um, so let's go into the character lineup real quick since I still have that over here. Uh, so what I had was Quake with Grax, uh, Nautica with uh, Styler, and um, Night Racer, and uh, yeah, basically the idea was to uh, get these guys loaded up as as big as possible so that they can basically force your force your opponent to swing into them and then uh, do Quake stuff where he pings the opponent every time characters die, and then. Uh, he, he's a pretty solid six attack three defense finisher with a plus five health so that was the basic game plan against uh, my round one one opponent who was uh, Sumori um, I think the matchup went pretty easily I don't remember too much of it because it's been a few weeks so sorry to Sumori but uh, you were a cool dude uh, and then I played Shenwu in uh, round two and I also don't remember that because it was a few weeks ago. <laughs> so, but we've played a few times in the in the Corona Cups as well as uh, this tournament. So we we we're pretty familiar with each other. But uh, round three, I played against Dan, and Dan has the craziest pool in my opinion of the entire thing. And I was actually a little sad that he actually built it right because he had horrible in his pool as well. And but he actually he ended up building it right and putting three relevant attackers and there's just no way that I could do anything about that because he had improvised shields and I did not so uh, yeah I got smashed yeah. but uh, round four I played against Stefan and it was a hard fought victory it came down to the wire every every game uh, the second game he had last stand and just destroyed <laughs> my Grax so <laughs> that, it was a lot of fun but um, yeah uh, after beating Stefan I was able to intentional draw against my round five opponent and here we are in top eight so which is great um real quick before we actually go through the pools themselves uh, um how do you feel about the pool you were assigned uh, for top eight or that you randomly got assigned so the uh it was one or two nights before the pools got assigned i went through and looked through all of them real quick uh did some like theory crafting like testing like looking at the pip ratios and whatnot and i would say my pool was probably in top pool the top two that i wanted in uh like if we're talking like power level i think mine was top two all right uh well i wish that i could say the same for my pool yeah uh, <laughs> i i i don't hate my pool but uh, I, there is probably maybe like one, there's one for sure I wanted less than this one. And there's maybe two, there's maybe a second I, I wanted less than this one. Um, so this was in my bottom three for sure and probably in my bottom two. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I, it's, it's up to me to play it, to build it correctly and do what I can with it. I actually think that um, one of the things that having a bad pool does uh, or not a bad pool, but a, a, a suboptimal pool, a lower end of the curve pool, um, is it does let you kind of like really test your mental metal. Like, how do you maximize what the what the cards you have can do? Uh, so, thank you for laying out the characters. I think that's the, the best place to start. <laughs> um, so, I, I think I think that uh, if we can hold off on the battle cards for just a second, uh, and I can talk through the characters, that'd be really helpful for sure, me. Sure, sure. So, you'll go. You'll notice that the two stratagems that I got with my two normal characters, who are Brawn, or sorry, not Brawn, who are Gears um, and Bludgeon, uh, I got Heroic Spotlight, which does, and you can quote me on this, nothing. It does nothing. <laughs> because the only star card in the set is Lucky Dodge, and I opened zero Lucky Dodges. Um, and then I got Revenge, and I don't have a Megatron. So you can just move those cards off to the side, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, that's Because a good... <laughs> uh, they are. They're actually functionally useful, except for they cost stars. Um, now, we can also look at the head that I've got. Now, if you can move the head a little bit more center, that would be hugely helpful. Um, so the heads that I've gotten are Clobber, Flintlock, Chasm, and Autobot Styler. 
Uh, now, Styler made a bit of an uh, appearance earlier on the show when you were talking about your Swiss rounds. Um, he's a two-star uh, head that gives plus one defense to the person that he is, uh, uh, how would you describe it? Like, attached to? A part of? Uh, I'd probably say attached. I don't, anyway, what, yeah, the attached to, for the character he's attached to. Um, and then something you might notice that my other three heads have in common is they are all four stars, which is really rough because the average star cost of my uh, large size characters is also really high. The lowest I have is a seven star, and the next lowest I have is an eight star tight or body mode character who requires a head. So I literally have no combinations of characters that enable me to play three wide. Trapping yourself into two wide and sealed, I think, or into two tall and sealed is, it's not a death sentence, but in formats with lots of black pips, like it's really rough. Um, that said, I do think at least one of our top eight uh, fellows qualified for top eight using a two tall deck. So yep. that's Chuck. something to note. I will say this: of the of the characters I've gotten as like that are body mode characters, all of them are pretty strong. All of the body modes are pretty strong. Um, Wolfwire has tons of card advantage. You can swing for a big number. Chrome Dome is interactive. Mind Wipe is good at interactive. Skull Smasher is maybe the best um, character to have if you're going to have a two tall deck um, so the question for me is like, what am I supposed to do to maximize these characters to make a lineup that's the most reasonable now what I've deduced is it comes down to one of either two combinations and both of those combinations have chrome dome in it uh, chrome dome is a massively impressive card uh, he has great health per star, so he's already at 13 for eight stars, which is just awesome. He's got higher gross health than Mind Wipe or Wolf Wire, and he's a star less, so he's star cheaper. Um, so Chrome Dome is either going to be played, uh, I guess my main board lineup, I have Chrome Dome with Chasm on it as his head. So Chrome Dome and Chasm mean that when you flip Chrome Dome on the first turn, You'll be able to, to KO an action from your opponent's hand. Hopefully they have one. Um, and then he'll be a seven base attacker, which is no joke. right? Mm -hmm. That's, I literally talked about that being the reason I wanted to play Megatron um, when I played Megatron during my Swiss rounds. Um, and so one of the reasons why I'm picking Chasm and not Flitlock or Clobber or, or, or Styler right now is because of the fact that while Styler, I think, is uh, a reasonable buff to give Chrome Dome, um, I think it's what's more important when having a too tall deck or too tall lineup is that both of your characters are real attackers. They can't, you cannot have less than less than two relevant attackers. I don't think in this game, or at least in this sealed format. Um, and one of the other things that, that you have to notice that that uh, Chronum does is he's really good at interacting and diminishing the resources your opponent has in hand. And there are fewer guaranteed ways of card advantage within sealed. So once we're already on that plan, the other character that is part of my main uh, my main lineup is actually Mind Wipe. So if you move Mind Wipe to the front, please. Okay. So Mind Wipe, when you flip to his alt mode, you get to functionally espionage um, your opponent, uh, which is really strong. But then if you flip to his other mode, you'll notice that when he attacks and you flip a black pip, something that is uh, very common in Wave 5 or in most sealed formats, and probably pretty good to be playing in most sealed formats, that they have to scrap a card from their hand. So in order to get the most out of this character, I want to guarantee that I can hit black cards when I'm attacking, and also make sure he's a relevant attacker, meaning the clobber satisfies this condition most, in my opinion. Now these two characters together, while they might not have the highest health pool, one thing to note for those of you at home is that the highest possible health total that I can play on my team, regardless of combination, is 27. These characters combined have 25. So what you're actually giving up is not very much, and what you are guaranteeing is that both of these characters are solid attackers. Especially when we get to the battle deck, you'll see that at bold three, I have a reasonable number of orange pips in my deck and a solid number of black pips in my deck. So that bold is gonna come into play. Um, and then so a five bold three and a base seven attacker are both super substantial. On top of the fact that both of them are compounding the effect on my opponent uh, that basically they're going to have a really, really hard time optimally using both their upgrade and their action each turn due to the fact that I'm interacting with their hands so much. 
One of the reasons why I picked this lineup was that I was able to deduce a flip order that made a lot of sense to me. So, um, like I said, on the first turn you're normally flipping Chrome Dome because you want to, you can only take specifically actions with Chrome Dome's uh, body mode ability. And then when you're when you're attacking on the second turn you're going to be flipping uh, Mind Wipe into his body mode and attacking, hopefully hitting a Black Pip and eating another card out of your opponent's hand. Then the following turn, after people have untapped, you'll be switching Chrome Dome back to his uh, alt mode, and you'll be attacking with Mind Wipe again. So Mind Wipe will be able to uh, swing in, hopefully hit another uh, Black Pip, eat another card out of your opponent's hand, uh, and then by that point, you can on the, on the following turn, you can either flip Chrome Dome if you know they picked up like a Green Pip action, say something like a Hold the Line or a Mission Briefing, um, or you can flip Mind Wipe back to his uh, to his alt mode because he's an additional defense there and is thus a better defender. Um, so that's an easy and uh, a flip order that makes sense and that is something that I think is really important to consider when you're building a team is to understand who you're attacking with when and who and what mode they want to be attacking in and what order you want to be spending your flips per turn on. Um, the other option, and this is something that I do plan on sideboarding into should I face uh, any deck that has uh, or I guess like a pool that has a plethora of blue pips it is actually to keep Chrome Dome in, but to move Styler in as his head. And then to sideboard out Mind Wipe and to sideboard in Skull Smasher. Now the question with Skull Smasher is, do I want to play him with or do I want to play him with Chasm? Um, and I think one of the important things to note here is whether or not my opponent has access to at least one, maybe two copies of Magnetic Dysfunction Ray. If my opponent has access to copies of Magnetic Dysfunction Ray, uh, then what I'm, I'm going to want to play Chasm over Clobber because that means that at least one of my characters will not be an Autobot which is going to be really important in that instance. If they don't have access to that, I think that Clobber might actually be the more important uh, head because being able to combine the potential Pierce from uh, Skull Smasher alongside with the additional, like, the additional chance to flip more Black Pips, attacking for something like 7 Pierce 6 is absolutely unbelievable if you're trying to do so. And this lineup also grants me the added benefit of two additional health. So... Having two additional health means that in long, drawn-out games uh, that I'm going to be able to survive more wheel turns. So this is the lineup that I would field against a blue heavy pool. Um, I think that's probably all I can say about the characters. Let's move on to the battle cards. All right. And Kai, thank you for uh, mechanically operating this. <laughs> <laughs> Got to give the YouTube viewers something side. to watch. Because <laughs> just having my, my arm be there absolutely. statically is not going to work out. <laughs> I don't know, it's a pretty nice arm. It could be a hand model if you wanted to. I think we'll start oh, with the thanks, rare battle man. cards. Uh, one, of the things, one of the things I did here uh, in this pool was I just kind of, normally what they do is I organize these by pips, and I did do that. But for the in the interest of the, of the viewer at home, I think what we're gonna do is kind of run through a slightly different process, which is I'm going to cull the, the battle cards by rarity of their playability. So uh, if you look at my, my rare battle cards, one of the things that is really bad is Headbutt. Headbutt is a bad card, and you shouldn't play Headbutt, particularly if you're not in a wide team. So if you do me a favor and pull Headbutt um, to the unplayable zone. Now, uh, you'll also notice that like in both of the lineups that I mentioned, neither of those character combinations have a ranged character, meaning the green pip on Paralyzo Box is functionally not there for the vast majority of things. I'm still going to play it. Because, as you'll see later, I have other incentives to play uh, weapons, just in mass. Uh, the chance at a plus four is really strong. Uh, and white pips are really good and sealed because they help you dig through your deck for your green pips more. They help you uh, find your blue, your actually combat relevant pips, like blue, black, and orange, with more consistency. And my pool just wasn't blessed with that many really good white pips. Um, so, Headbutt is the only card that is absolutely unplayable for my rares. Um, the maybes in my rares are probably versatility and counter espionage, and then I would absolutely play Metallicado, Paralyzo Box, and Escape Capsule. Um, so would you go ahead and lay out the, the uncommons? Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Now, my uncommons, culling the unplayables was super, super easy, in all honesty. Um, the first two are conversion expertise. Get those out of this deck. White pips are good, right? But I don't have enough blue pips to justify wanting the tough in alt mode that that card grants you. And because I'm basically always going to be fielding two Titan Masters or two body mode characters, the bot mode text is actually blank. So that card was an easy cut from two of them. The next easy cut is Triangulator because Triangulator doesn't do anything. So both copies of Triangulator get out of my deck. The last easy cut from here is gonna be the high five, which Kai was already reaching for, but he waited for me to actually say. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that, I appreciate that. Um, one of the things to note here is that I think the maybes uh, in this are probably last stand. Um, the second copy of Concealing Contrails, uh, and the emergency repair patch. I think all of those are maybe considerations. I'm not sure. So Concealing Controls is a strong card, and as you're already probably noting, there's a totally reasonable number of black pips in my deck, but one of the things we're gonna get to when you see the next part of these cards, uh, the common rarity ones, is that I actually have a lot of offensively relevant combat actions, and I'm pretty confident that it is better to be spending both your upgrade and your action phase to be doing something offensive unless it is guaranteeing your character will live. So having a second copy of Concealing Contrails is probably not the best spending of a slot, especially because I haven't culled that many cards in all actuality. Right now, I've cut six cards from my pool of 36, so I have five more cuts to make to get down to where I need to be. Okay, let's lay out the common cards, please. All right, the first thing to note when you see these common cards is one, that I have a pretty solid amount of card advantage. <laughs> I have two copies of Scouting Missions and a Mission Briefing. Uh, that is no joke. Um, I also have a really solid number of combat relevant actions. I have a Lock on Target. I have uh, two Blade Flurries, which is an awesome card. I have a Hand-to-Hand -hand Combat. Those are all excellent, excellent cards that you're going to want to play basically every single time. Um, now, there are a couple cards in here that are just suboptimal, and we're going to get them out of our deck. Hull Down is probably the first example of a card that's like this. Now, I have no tanks in my lineup. I guess I have Bludgeon, but I'm not playing him in either of my lineups. So Hull Down's orange pip is functionally blank. It's an easy cut on top of the fact that, if you'll remember, my justification for cutting conversion expertise is because of the fact that I didn't have enough blues to justify having tough as a consistent want for a card in my deck. Hold on is only tough, it's one time use every time you use it, and it eats your actions, which at this point you're probably looking at this pool and going, I think Richard has a ton of actions in his pool, which if you're if you're saying that, you're you're totally right for one. And number two, I think this is actually the first pool of note that I've seen that has a plethora of actions and not as many playable upgrades. Um, to keep in matter, that's something to keep in mind just because of the fact that what you're trying to do when you're building pools like this is keep a mostly balanced a ratio of actions to upgrades. Um, so the other easy cut is decoy flares. If I, like I mentioned, um, it's better to be spending your phases to be affecting your offensive capability. Decoy flares is an armor, so it's not, it's not, it's not affecting your offensive capability, and it doesn't have very good combat pips to flip, and it doesn't actually give you a plus two. So plus two armors are normally what I want to be playing if I'm, if I'm going to be playing armors. For example, emergency repair patch is strictly better than decoy flares as far as I'm concerned because of the fact that it has a more relevant pip and because of the fact that it has a heal one built into it, which means it's more like a plus 1.5 that sits around with a better combat pip than decoy flares is, which is a plus one with a bad combat, flip, combat pip um, that doesn't do anything when it actually comes into play. So the decoy flares is an easy cut as well. Now, at this point, I have cut eight of my 36 cards. I have three more cuts to make, uh, which is, this is pretty tough. So I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to the maybe piles. Now, last stand is the first card that I cut from the maybe pile. If you'll go ahead and cut last stand. Last stand is an excellent card in sealed, but the problem is I'm too tall. So the cost of KOing my characters is functionally half of my relevant lineup. It's only good at the very end of the game in this lineup. If I had a smaller character to be paired along two, two mid-sized and large-sized characters, I would be absolutely including Last Stand because the cost is diminished and because the actual, like, like the ceiling of what it can do is so, so high. But I think the fact that I have other relevant combat pumps and the fact that my character lineup is only too tall means that's a card that I can cut with 
and cut and feel pretty confident about doing so. Now the second card I'm going to cut is Concealing Contrails, the second copy, which was one of the cards we also put in the maybe pile earlier. For all the reasons I mentioned in the first place, which was I want to be spending my actions uh, doing something offensive, uh, and I want to be spending my other phases doing something offensive if I can as well. Now, it doesn't have a green pip. I do have a reasonable number of black pips, but I have no access to tough, so I can't actually uh, really guarantee that I'm going to get more than maybe like a plus two out of this card. Plus two is strong. Plus two is worth playing for, but um, it's going to be really hard for me to maximize anything more than that without flipping the singleton laser scalpel that I'm currently playing. Um, the next card that I cut is versatility. So versatility is a card that I actually played in my Swiss rounds. It's a rare. The heal is really important if you have like a character who is what your deck hinges around and access to relevant bold a lot of the time. I do have access to relevant bold. Clobber, right? Um, Clobber is going to be really strong. But the thing is, I don't actually believe that the healing on characters of this low of health is going to earn me an actual full extra round or an extra attack worth of health, which is where I found that card maybe being a uh, lower consideration. Something to note is, if you remember if, when I talked about my sideboard lineup against blue heavy lineups, versatility is a card that I would be bringing in to continue the theme of that sideboarded lineup against a blue heavy or defense heavy pool, because this is the kind of card that helps you stay relevant in longer exchanges or more turns of combat. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm keeping the counter espionage and the emergency repair patch over the other cards that I cut. The emergency repair patch was a keep mostly because of the fact that I was at a much larger number of actions when we got to the 28 card version of this pool. I was at 17 actions and 11 upgrades. Now if you look on the screen now you'll notice that there are 11 upgrades still in play and the three cards that we cut, if you'll pull those out real quick, Kai, the last stand, the second concealing contrails, and the versatility were all actions. So we cut three actions to go down to 14 actions, so our split now is 14, 11 in favor of actions, and this is the battle deck that I ended up sleeving. Um, Kai, do you have any additional thoughts after what I've explained? No, a lot of it makes sense. Um, I probably would have kept the versatility or at least tried um, like some test runs with the deck first just to see how versatility would work. Um, I pro probably would have just not played the Concealing Cause Trails and played Last Stain instead because uh, for me... If you draw it, then you basically just hold it until your head pops off, and then you just get another big swing with the head, which is what I would probably end up needing to do. Well, I feel you probably end up needing to do in your decks because your like clobber is going to be relevant as an attacker, but um, chasm is not particularly strong. Like he has four attack, but that's his best stat. So yeah, but mm -hmm. other other than that, I think I would probably have kept the same pool. Like probably may have swapped something out for. Um, hit and run since you can't actually play it but it's a, a it's also a white so there's that but yeah i probably yeah. would have something kept this the same. go ahead something to know about the commons the last two commons that are reasonable includes in my deck in my opinion are laser scalpel and hit and run i think because my character is going to be attacking for a lot of damage that laser scalpel is not maximized my deck but it is relevant when my heads pop off and then they attack hit and run being a white and a black pip is just really strong White pips are something I, I told you I didn't have any playable white pips in my pool. If you look right now on screen, there are four white pips. Uh, there is Mission Briefing, there's Hold the Line, there's Hit and Run, and there's Paralyzo Box. Paralyzo Box and Hit and Run are mostly medium, but they but they are good enough cards, and the black pip on Hit and Run is what makes it a good enough card that I feel comfortable playing this. Um, cards like Hit and Run, uh, Handheld Blaster, and Improvised Shield and Laser Scalpel are one of the reasons why I'm playing counter espionage over the versatility, as far as like the rare maybe pile, for example, because I want to have access to enough greens to cycle those cards back into my deck. Counter espionage is really more about having the green pip than anything else for the card. I also think maximizing the number of pips in my deck is pretty important for getting the most value out of Master of Metallicado that I can, because I think that's probably the best card that I opened. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. All right. I totally see your argument for Last Stand too, by, by the way. Yeah. But yeah, that's the deck I, I, uh, I put. All right, so that was that's Richard's uh, pool. So we're gonna cut to for a little bit just so that I can put all my pool out because uh, 
I kind of have an interesting pool that has to look at both the, the battle deck and the characters at the same time. So we'll cut for a little bit. All right, so we're back with my pool. And um, immediately, I think you may notice this two of my characters are horrible. And I also have a health head and a stealth head, which is pretty crazy onto itself. But uh, so before we get into any of that, though, I, I want to say all 3D stratagems, get them out of here. They don't, we, <laughs> you can't even play them, so. Both of us, both of us, we talked about this in our video on Sealed, was that like 90% of the stratagems you open are going to be useless mm -hmm. in Sealed. Yeah, like literally, and I just think like it's literally funny that... Outback and Megatron are the only ones who have, and uh, Brawn are the only ones who have relevant stratagems, so there's that. <laughs> but yeah, so initially, so I have a lot of strong attackers in my pool. I have Megatron and Crankcase, uh, two of the strongest attackers in this set. And I also have two Horribles with uh, two relevant heads for them specifically. However, uh, I'm not going to be able to run Double Horrible unless I do Double Horrible and Crankcase. And I feel that's fine, except that uh, perusing my um, battle pips, uh, you'll see that I actually have one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, uh, seven, eight, I guess, but uh, only eight black pip cards so even if I draw one of them that's not using horrible to its uh, maximum potential and I'm just gonna be relying on crankcase to while these guys are blocking and that's not what horrible strength is so we're not even gonna consider him so so that leaves Megatron and then we have uh, crankcase and two six stars so this actually here, if we do one of the two six stars, seven star, and Megatron with Krev, is actually 25 exact. So now it's just a matter of who, who matters more. And I ended up going with Beachcomber because uh, I, have double, I have double mission briefing. So Crankcase is going to get a lot of work in. So I'm realistically going to be flipping Beachcomber then Crankcase, then Megatron, and then just going in, drawing three. That's cool in uh, Gravy, but um, these two have the same stats in bot mode, and the focus one, I feel, is probably going to be better in the long run in helping him stay alive longer and hit harder. So I ended up going with Beachcomber, Crankcase, and Megatron with the crab head. So that ended up being my character lineup. That being said, I can side into the horrible... Uh, a single horrible and play like uh, these two but I, I just don't have the black pips for that to be particularly relevant unless someone else's pool is necessary for me to take them out of combat which I don't believe from the top of my head uh, that that's necessary so so that's going to be our character lineup and uh, so onto the um, the way I usually go with sorting my battle cards is by pips but we, right now we have them sorted out by rarity so first thing I'm going to do is just take out all the orange cards I don't care really what they do unless it's hold down and they're just gonna they're basically going to increase my offensive every, by every single moment possible because of the focus from uh, Beachcomber so I believe that's all of the orange cards uh, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven orange cards with two improvised shields is very solid, as well as having two of the best attackers in the format. So I would say mine is very aggressively slanted already. So we want to keep that into consideration while we get all the weapons. So we're going to be grabbing Energon Mace, Paralyzer Box, um, Crystal of Power, Industrial Phase Grade Charge, Sharpen Talons. Uh, Brass Knuckles isn't a weapon, but it's bold too, so it's a weapon. And then Grab Inhibitor as well. <laughs> so that's all the weapons. <laughs> and then of course, since we're playing Crankcase, we have to play all the draw cards, so we're playing, we're going to be adding the two mission briefings in as well. So now we have to decide um, what do we value most, and I would probably say uh, I would probably grab two of the hollow matters like so 
I think you can make a case for hollow matter and a regenerative core, but I think um, double hollow matter is probably just a little stronger in the end because you just the ultimately I just want to see one of them. I don't care if when I see the hollow matter, I just want to see one of them uh, ASAP. So just doing that in order to protect either crankcase or Megatron is strong. And then if you somehow manage to get it on both of them, then I think it's just better in the long run. So two hollow matter and then we're going to grab the two uh, things of direct damage that we have. So because we need the direct damage and then from here, um, Blade Flurry and Hold the Line are also pretty impressive in this format. So we're going to be playing those and the end hostility, since I have the double improvised shields, it can come to a situation to where I could protect one, which was pretty frustrating. But one of the things that brings me to is, like I mentioned, I actually won game one despite having a two tall lineup and a battle deck that is probably like a B plus. Um, and which uh, Kai in the early part of this video, you suggested that I should play Last Stand um, in my main deck. Yes, yes. And I should have. I greatly miss that card. <laughs> um, my little my little heads would have been really important for them to be able to actually swing uh, near the end there. Um, I did play Last Stand in one of the other games, and it was it was the only way I only way I had, a, I had a chance to win. I needed him to flip like blue 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 on his attack, but um, that was the only chance I had. Uh, and so, but one of the things I wanted to say was the fact that. I was on the play in game one, and it let me take down the game. So I mean, if you are too tall, don't have like no hope, right? Like I think there's one or two people from the top eight who actually had two tall lineups um, leading into their qualification. And yeah. I in particular, like I I felt like pretty good on the play. It was just on the draw. I just had no selection. You know, you only have two attacks and for half of your attacks to be basically completely irrelevant or all of your attacks be irrelevant before the first wheel turn is just, it's brutal strategically. So, yeah, I was pretty happy with um, the way I ended up building things. I wouldn't have changed much else, and I just wish that I had had a pool that was uh, a slightly more forgiving. You know? Yeah. Unfortunately, that's kind of how uh, Titan Masters attack is because of um, the pool selection. So. There being only two five stars in the uh, entire thing is kind of, kind of rough. In all honesty, <laughs> mm -hmm. you had one in your uh, Swiss rounds. You had the night racer. I had the only night racer in the tournament. That is true. But uh, she she died. She got two shot every round. So there's that. <laughs> <laughs> I did have so in my Swiss rounds. I definitely had Braun was one of my lineup pieces. Um, and there were definitely two different games where the first swing just wiped him. The first swing into Braun just wiped him. And Oof. I was like, oh, okay. I definitely also had um, this guy set a plane get wiped by a crankcase wearing a fusion borer. Uh, and like just flipped like two or three oranges. And I was like, well, I, uh, my character is dead. My yeah, that, dead. that's one thing about the uh, Titan Masters uh, sealed pool that I, would, I was very surprised about how consistent ev there were. There were situations where you can consistently get to like 10 or 12 or even 15, 20 or whatever because mm -hmm. I've seen those numbers posted and I've seen the plays, got hit by some of the plays. Uh, but uh, yeah, Titan Master's attack is actually a fairly relevant attack set, oddly enough. Who would have thought? <laughs> I know. How about that? I um, did say, like, I think one of the things that contributed to, like, my rounds never felt like they were coming close to time. Yeah, yeah. I had one round that was um, close, but it was me and Stefan, and we were, we really had to like grind our gears in order to figure out like how we were going to win this matchup. And yeah, that was that was a rough match. But uh, yeah, other than that, this 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 uh, pool actually goes pretty quickly. So that's that's pretty good design on Wizards' part for sure. Agree, absolutely agree, and I think that you know one of the things people probably complained about a little bit of uh, uh, like way four was that the, you had a lot of Pierce, so like every turn it felt like you weren't doing nothing, but it still got pretty close to time on like several rounds during like EI and stuff, you know? Yeah. It was just lower, like there were high health pools and stuff like that. Basically, every every team was three if not four wide, so. Yeah. I think it was also because it was a very blue set and there wasn't that many orange cards, but uh, that's that's besides the point. Uh, where did I put mm -hmm. my stuff? Okay. Yeah, so how, how did your topic go? 
Uh, so for refreshers, this is my lineup that I played. Uh, so I ended up playing against Fred Kong from, uh, shoot, I want to say Malaysia, but I'm pretty sure it's Malaysia, but if it isn't Malaysia, I'm sorry, but it, I, I'm, I've been confusing the two lately, but, uh, uh, Fred Kong, uh, he's, he's a really cool dude. We, we talked about, uh, running a store cause, uh, I had some aspirations to run a store some down, sometime down in the future, so that was really nice conversation. But uh, for his match, uh, we basically had it was basically who could get their crankcase up more, and uh, he basically. So if you didn't know his pool, he had triple blade flurry and triple supporting fire, and he played that all three games, and that kind of destroyed my that basically one shot any of my characters. So. Uh, it basically came down to can I prevent him from doing that or if I can or if he does get to that how can I uh, kill his crank shot or crankcase next turn uh, on the wheel which uh, unfortunately I could not do game one because uh, my two mission briefings were in my at the bottom of my deck and I played my Megatron aggressively because I was assuming that they would not be at the bottom of my deck but they were so uh, crankcase swung for four and I lost um, uh, game two, I I made him go second, and that pretty much was able to dictate the uh, match because he swung into Megatron. Uh, he did kill Megatron, but I was able to swing back with Crankcase and kill his Crankcase, and then he didn't have much of an offensive force after that. And then game three, I had to go first, and then I had to be able to get my Crankcase up in order to kill him, uh, in order to kill his Crankcase, or in order to kill his... Um, uh, second character or his first character and then uh, on the I have to help Megatron survive which Megatron did not because again Blade Flurry weapon crankcase swing for base 8 is a thing so uh, yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> pretty rough but um, yeah I think I don't know the only thing that we mentioned about my uh, build pool was the hit and run and the uh, triangulators being interesting and honestly I couldn't tell you if the triangulators was right or not because I had it was basically a wheel and then the game was over so <laughs> uh yeah never, never came up never yeah came up. I I was able to play triangulator on the game too with Megatron but um it didn't particularly matter too much so uh I'll probably rule as a uh, too cute for the time being but uh yeah I think okay. that was kind of how my round ended up going all right well two questions then so one um how did you feel about like the general tournament structure and like the handling of the tournament from Vector Sigma? Uh, it was actually pretty great. I think the way they handled the pools was fantastic because uh, if you didn't know, what they basically did was they they uh, uploaded a video of them opening uh, each uh, each of the pools. So it was six packs. They would open the six packs, show you all the cards, and then all the heads, shard gems, characters, and whatnot, and then. While you could see onto the video in order to make sure like if your pool had any mistakes because they put a Google Drive, uh, Google document up later that showed you like what you had and everything. And uh, that was how all the pools got assigned. And that was actually very, very cool and interesting way to handle in a virtual setting. And yeah, it took a lot of time and effort too. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, Scott had the product, product so. <laughs> but uh, yes. Uh, I really like that idea a lot, and um, cutting to top eight, um, they had they basically had it to where you when you go into top eight you had a separate pool, which is what we did, in the first part of the video where we showed you how we would build that pool and whatnot. But uh, that was also an interesting idea and something that uh, Wizards has also expressed interest in doing. So uh, hopefully that get, this gave them uh, some information, if not adequate information. Yeah, I think so too. Um, I, uh, I I liked how they handled it. Um, I I really love the pre-registered pools in all honesty, um, because I think well, it's less work for me. Um, I understand that it's a you know pretty much a labor of love from the people who are organizing the tournament. Um, but I would I would do it again, honestly. Like when Wave Six comes around, you know, especially if we're all still in like similar circumstances as far as like you know um, the ability to go outside stuff like that, I would. Three, two, one. Hey guys, Kai here with TransformYourGame.net, and we are back. Um, Richard is also back. Say hi. Hi, people. 
Uh, so we are back with um, our top eight uh, report, I guess is the best way to put it, I guess. Like yeah. poster report. I would, call, I would call it a postmortem. <laughs> postmortem, yes. Yes, we both did get slaughtered. Spoiler alert. Yeah. But um, uh... yeah. We're both dead in the tournament. So... <laughs> but the tournament's over. Congratulations to... Um, I don't even kind of remember who won because it was kind of unceremonious, but... Uh, I want to say it was one of the Vector Sigma guys. Yeah, it was, it was Dan or Scott for sure. Sorry, I didn't... I didn't. I should have looked it up before, but oh well. Uh, congratulations yeah, to yeah. them for uh, winning. Uh, there's some details about that that if you want to more more details, feel free to ask them. I don't have the exact details and don't want to butcher them, so uh, we'll just leave it at that. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, so you and I, Richard, we got top eight. And we, uh, we both got slaughtered in our top eight match. So 100%. Uh, so to be fair, to be fair. Okay, so um, I think in the first part of this video, I, I talked about how the fact that like I, I thought my pool was really pretty poor mm -hmm. because of the fact that I had no possible character combinations that would take me like larger or wider than too tall. Um, but I want to say that the battle cards in my pool were actually really strong. Um, and that was something I had not super counted on. Uh, so it actually led me to take down my first game in my first in my quarterfinals match. So I played oh, against man. Dan. Um, so Dan's uh, Dan's Dan's pool was was okay. It was it was pretty good. He had a couple ways he could have played it. Um, uh, I think like he had he had a possibility like he had a couple lineup combinations where he could play double horrible. <sighs> Although against me, he just he had, he was Megatron with I cannot remember what head. Um, and then he also had double brawn. So he had brawn brawn Megatron. Oh, that head. cool. <laughs> Um, and, uh, those little dudes being relevant attackers against what I was bringing against like such low health totals. Like I was, I was never, I never really stood a chance. Right. Um, I, the only reason I won the first game is because, uh, I was able to, uh, eat a couple cards from his hand and then swing with and hitting like all of my oranges when I was attacking with my guys. So, um, as far as like the characters I actually ended up playing, I was pretty happy. I think this is what we we're supposed to be doing. Um, was we was leaning into the discard uh, aspect of the of the lineups that I was given. Um, I just wish that I had gotten some one star heads, and maybe like a five star or something to play. But you know, um, you can't you can't win them all. I didn't get the chance. Actually, that's not true. In game two, I did sideboard in, into the Skull Smasher lineup. Do you remember I was talking about that at all? Yeah, yeah, I remember vaguely. Yes. Yeah. So in game two, I started the one that you see in front of you, but in game two, I kept Chrome Dome, um, and I kept, uh, is Chasm is the plus two attack head? Yeah. Um, but but instead I boarded in Styler and Skull Smasher for the other two characters. Oh, I don't know where Styler is. Um, and I put, I put Chasm onto, I put Chasm onto uh, uh, Skull Smasher, and I put Styler, who is the def plus one defense head, onto Chrome Dome to make him just a little bit tankier. Um, and that, so that way my Skull Smasher was going to be a relevant attacker for the whole game. Um, and then he was also going to be able to kind of counteract the bronze in some small portion. I'm sorry for the yawns. I don't know what's going on here. We are recording a little late tonight, so you'll that's, have to excuse both of us, folks. Yeah, I, uh, I I hope that you can forgive me or we can maybe fix it in post either way. I, um, I'm not going to be able to fix it in post. <laughs> <laughs> we tried, we tried. Um, anyway... So this lineup, um, when I brought it in, was partially for science because I didn't think that I was going to win on the draw with either of my lineups. Um, so I wanted to see if Skull Smasher was going to be effective against the five stars. He actually really did. He looked pretty impressive. But um, every attack that came out of Megatron in this game, too, was e enormous. Like, <laughs> they were they were absurd. He'd be attacking. He'd be doing, like, 12 damage. I could not flip a blue on defense. Um, and... Uh, so I, I lost game two pretty decidedly, and then game three. Um, so one, one of the things that's funny is like my Chrome Dome bricked on his flip ability to uh, body mode, both in game one and game three. He just had three upgrades in hand, um, which was pretty frustrating. But one of the things that brings me to is, like I mentioned, I actually won game one despite having a two tall lineup and a battle deck that is probably like a B plus, um, and which. Uh, Kai, in the earlier part of this video, you suggested I should play Last Stand um, in my main deck. Yes, yes. And I should have. I greatly miss that card. <laughs> um, my little my little heads would have been really important for them to be able to actually swing uh, near the end there. Um, I did play Last Stand in one of the other games, and it was it was the only way I only way I had a, I had a chance to win. 
I needed him to flip like blue 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 on his attack, but um, that was the only chance I had. Uh, and so, but one of the things I wanted to say was the fact that I was on the play in game one, and it let me take down the game. So I mean, if you are too tall, don't have like no hope, right? Like I think there's one or two people from the top eight who actually had two tall lineups um, leading into their qualification, and. Yeah. I in particular like I I felt like pretty good on the play. It was just on the draw. I just had no selection. You know, you only have two attacks, and for half of your attacks to be basically completely irrelevant, or all of your attacks to be irrelevant before the first wheel turn is just it's brutal strategically. So yeah, I was pretty happy with um, the way I ended up building things. I wouldn't have changed much else, and I just wish that I had had a pool that was uh, a slightly more forgiving. You know? Yeah. Unfortunately, that's kind of how uh, Titan Master's attack is because of um, the pool selection. So there being only two five stars in the uh, entire thing is kind of kind of rough, in all honesty. <laughs> mm -hmm. You had one in your uh, Swiss rounds. You had the Night Racer. I had the only Night Racer in the tournament. That is true. But uh, she she died. She got two shot every round. So there's that. <laughs> <laughs> I did have so in my Swiss rounds I definitely had Braun was one of my lineup pieces um, and there were definitely two different games where the first swing just wiped him the first swing into Braun just wiped him and Oof. I was like oh okay I definitely also had um, this guy had a plane get wiped by a crankcase wearing a fusion borer uh, and like just flipped like two or three oranges and I was like well I uh, my character is dead yeah, that, that's one thing about the uh, Titan Masters uh, sealed pool that I, would, I was very surprised about how consistent ev there were there were situations where you can consistently get to like 10 or 12 or even 15, 20 or whatever because mm -hmm. I've seen those numbers posted and I've seen the plays got hit by some of the plays uh, but uh, yeah Titan Masters attack is actually a fairly relevant attack set oddly enough who would have thought <laughs> I know how about that I did say, like, I think one of the things that contributed to, like, my rounds never felt like they were coming close to time. Yeah, yeah. I had one round that was um, close, but it was me and Stefan, and we were, we really had to, like, grind our gears in order to figure out, like, how we were going to win this matchup, and, yeah, that was, that was a rough match, but, uh, yeah, other than that, this, 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 uh, pool actually goes pretty quickly, so that's, that's pretty good design on Wizards part for sure. Agree, absolutely agree. And I think that you know one of the things people have probably complained about a little bit of uh, uh, like way four was that the, you had a lot of Pierce, so like every turn it felt like you weren't doing nothing, but it still got pretty close to time on like several rounds during like EI and stuff. You know? Yeah. It was just lower. Like there were high health pools and stuff like that. Basically every every team was three if not four wide. So. Yeah. I think it was also because it was a very blue set and there wasn't that many orange cards, but uh, that's that's besides the point. Uh, where did I put mm -hmm. my stuff? Okay. Yeah, so how, how did your topic go? Uh, so for refreshers, this is my lineup that I played. Uh, so I ended up playing against Fred Kong from, uh, shoot, I want to say Malaysia, but I'm pretty sure it's Malaysia, but if it isn't Malaysia, I'm sorry, but it I, I'm... I've been confusing the two lately, but uh, uh, Fred Kong, uh, he's he's a really cool dude. We we talked about uh, running a store because uh, I had some aspirations to run a store some down sometime down in the future. So that was really nice conversation. But uh, for his match, uh, we basically had it was basically who could get their crankcase up more, and uh, he basically. So if you didn't know his pool, he had triple blade flurry and triple supporting fire. And he played that all three games, and that kind of destroyed my... That basically one-shot any of my characters. So uh, it basically came down to, can I prevent him from doing that? Or if I can... Or if he does get to that, how can I uh, kill his crank shot, or crankcase next turn uh, on the wheel? Which, uh, unfortunately, I could not do game one because uh, my two mission briefings were in my at the bottom of my deck. And I played my Megatron aggressively because I was assuming that they would not be at the bottom of my deck, but they were. So uh, Crankcase swung for four, and I lost. Um, uh, game two, I 
I made him go second and that pretty much was able to dictate the uh, match because he swung into Megatron. Uh, he did kill Megatron, but I was able to swing back with Crankcase and kill his Crankcase, and then he didn't have much of an offensive force after that. And then game three, I had to go first, and then I had to be able to get my Crankcase up in order to kill him, uh, in order to kill his Crankcase, or in order to kill his um, uh, second character, or his first character, and then uh, on the I had to help Megatron survive, which Megatron did not because... Again, Blade Flurry weapon, crankcase swing for base 8 is a thing, so, uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> Pretty rough, but, um, yeah, I think, I don't know, the only thing that we mentioned about my uh, build pool was the hit and run, and the uh, triangulators being interesting, and honestly, I couldn't tell you if the triangulators was right or not, because I had, it was basically a wheel, and then the game was over. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. Never, never came up. Never yeah. Came up. I, I was able to play Triangulator on the game two with Megatron, but um, it didn't particularly matter too much. So, uh, I'll probably rule as uh, too cute for the time being. But, uh, yeah, I think okay. that was kind of how my round ended up going. All right. Well, two questions then. So, one, um, how did you feel about, like, the general tournament structure and, like, the handling of the tournament from Vector Sigma? Uh, it was actually pretty great. I think the way they handled the pools was fantastic because uh, if you didn't know, what they basically did was they they uh, uploaded a video of them opening uh, each, uh, each of the pools. So it was six packs. They would open the six packs, show you all the cards, and then all the heads, shard gems, characters, and whatnot. And then while you could see onto the video in order to make sure like if your pool had any mistakes because they put a Google Drive... Uh, Google document up later that showed you like what you had and everything and uh, that was how all the pools got assigned and that was actually very very cool and interesting way to handle in a virtual setting and yeah. it took a lot of time and effort too <laughs> oh yeah I mean Scott had the product product so <laughs> but uh, yes uh, I, I really like that idea a lot and um, cutting to top eight um, they had they basically had it to where you when you go into top eight you had a separate pool which is what we did in the first part of the video where we showed you how we would build that pool and whatnot but uh that was also an interesting idea and something that uh wizards has also expressed interest in doing so uh, hopefully that get, this gave them uh some information if not adequate information yeah i think so too um i uh i, I like how they handled it um i, I really love the pre-registered pools in all honesty um because I think, well, it's less work for me. Um, I understand that it's a, you know, pretty much a labor of love from the people who are organizing the tournament. Um, but I would, I would do it again, honestly. Like when Wave Six comes around, you know, especially if we're all still in like similar circumstances as far as like, you know, um, the ability to go outside stuff like that. I would do it again. I would absolutely do it again. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I love sealed. Uh, generally speaking, I think it's a really fun way to engage in the game. Um, and I actually love the second pool coming into top eight. I think, because uh, I think it's actually a way to reduce to reduce variance. Believe it or not, um, for example, like I think my pool in top eight was a wildly different from my pool in Swiss. I think my pool in Swiss was probably, you know, top half of the pools that got opened, and mm -hmm. my my pool in top eight was uh, was pretty bad. Um, like I think it was probably like one of the bottom like five or six or so. Uh, but if you take like all those cards together, like and average them across, I think you actually are lowering the the num the amount of variance that exists. So that's something interesting to, to you know like talk about. Um, I also think Titan Master Attack is maybe a little bit weird in that regard. So uh, the other thing, like I enjoyed it enough, and I think that Vector Simulator did, did a great job. So I'm happy to play in their next tournament, uh, the Constructor One. I think is coming up in not too long. I really need to decide if I'm going to play in that. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but luckily, both you and I got qualified for, uh, I think it's an invitation, like a quarterly thing. Do you know any more about that? Uh, so so this is information that I'm not particularly, uh, I don't have the exact, or I know the exact details. Am I going to ramble them exactly the way uh, Scott and uh, Dan have told me? No, because I kind of, <laughs> it's kind of, I already know I'm registered for it. So uh, it kind of just went over my head. But basically, um they they're adapting a style of um, invite similar to how Origins and Gen Con was run. So basically, if you didn't know how they were run, uh, 
they would have a Swiss or they would have a round of not round I guess a tournament where uh, top eight of that tournament would get uh, invited into the uh, the Sunday tournament which was basically the top 32 because there was going to be four tournaments and top eight from each of those with invites passing down and Vector Sigma is doing the same thing where top eight from this tournament is going into uh, the next tournament or into the Invitational and then the next tournament which I believe is I probably won't say a date just in case it uh, changes but sometime this week that you guys have seen this video um, it's that the top eight from this this upcoming tournament is also going to be invited into the uh, Invitational with invitation uh, with uh, invites passing down so if me and Richard also top eight at this event or uh, at this up next upcoming event then uh, we would then our invites would pass down to who to like ninth and tenth place uh, but yeah, basically it's that and then there'll be a, si a single elimination top 32 tournament basically after that and um, Yeah, that We'll see who's the best of that when that time comes, but uh, that is the structure as far as far as I know Or cool. remembered anyway yeah. um, I'm kind of pumped for that honestly like uh, oh, yeah. it's, I was I was playing in the original tournament kind of just like to play high-level play mm -hmm. like that's really mm -hmm. why I was in it so that's why I joined the tournament here. It's why I'm going to play in the next tournament. It's because I just miss the competition, you know, the challenge. That's why I play these types of things in the first place. Also because I, I stuck with Transformers because it's a really, really fun and thoroughly engaging way to do it, right? Um, but it's the competition that really drives me. So um, I, I don't know. I'm looking forward to it. I had a blast. I would do more. I would even do more sealed tournaments personally. I don't know how you feel, but yeah, uh, I'm, yeah, I think it's I'm cool fun. with sealed. I would yeah. I would love to get constructed because I want to see uh, what people have been brewing up. But yeah, sealed anytime is I'm almost always down for that. Dope. All right, man. Well, I don't have any more thoughts. Do you have anything else before we send it out? Uh, not particularly, but um, we do have the uh, the closing thoughts basically. Uh, so um, if you like this stuff, be sure to be sure to check out Vector Sigma first and first. First of all, because they they helped the tournament, they did a really good job with it. And if you're interested in joining the tournament here or whatever, uh, check them out. There'll be links in the description. Uh, but if you like this content, just feel free to subscribe or like or comment. Uh, doing that stuff helps us, and it helps us get feedback as well. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, guys. All right. So, this is me and Richard. We'll we'll see you guys in the, in later next time. Yeah, next time. <laughs> <laughs>